Um, my name is Tim Krasowski. I am the unit leader of the Hawaii Cooperative Fishery Research Unit. Um, and so a lot of you might be wondering what a Cooperative Fishery Research Unit is. And you might have to keep waiting for a second. Hang on. There we go. Um, so the whole reason why the co-op units, the system exists, and the reason I'm out here in Hawaii is because of a cartoonist. So J.N. Ding Darling um, was a political cartoonist in Iowa in the 1920s and 30s, Pulitzer Prize winning uh, cartoonist. And he was an avid outdoorsman, um, hunter and fisher. And he was very much concerned by the rapidly changing climate, declines in natural resources. Um, and bear in mind, this is the time of the, the Dust Bowl and the Great Depression in, in the Great Plains. But further, um, was really concerned by a lack of scientific data and the fact that there were very few trained scientists that were needed to manage natural resources in the states. At the time, um, if you went to work for a state um, natural resource agency, you got educated at the state land grant university and had a degree in agriculture, which was not really conducive to managing natural resources. So he put his money where his mouth was. He invested personal research, personal funds to establish the first co-op unit in 1932. And then pretty much worked tirelessly to convince the federal government to support an additional nine, which it did in, in 1936 uh, under the Fish and Wildlife Service. Uh, the program has grown. And so currently we, we are now, I had to update this figure yesterday because we've, we've just opened um, units in Michigan. Uh, the, the job announcement for the first uh, Michigan scientist went out just the last couple of weeks. And um, we just opened one in Nevada as well. So we currently have 42 units in 40 states. And um, the Hawaii unit is a fisheries only unit. And we are based here at the University of Hawaii at Hilo. Um, but the mission of the unit is to serve the, the entirety of the state of Hawaii. Um, the co-op unit system, so it's a, it's a federal state university partnership and the program has three primary missions and our, our primary purpose for being stationed at these different places around the country is to provide training to and this is directly lifted from our brochure i guess the conservation workforce of tomorrow so we are primarily here for graduate student education um, in order to accomplish that we conduct and facilitate actionable research to meet the needs of our cooperators and um, sort of as needed, we provide technical assistance to cooperators on integrating and applying new science into management. Around the country, every unit is different in how they, they operate and are managed, but, but really they all rely on relationships between three primary cooperators. And these cooperators are the federal agencies, the state natural resource management agency, and the state land grant university. So as part of this relationship, there's a lot of give and take. And so the, the federal agencies contributed, contribute to salaries of the unit scientists. So um, if you come and study at the co-op unit, um, your advisor is a, is a federal scientist with the US Geological Survey. Um, the federal agencies also provide some base funding and support as well. And in return, the federal agencies receive access to scientific expertise housed within the university. Um, they're able to provide money to the university at, at an indirect, at a reduced indirect cost rate. And most importantly for the students, because a lot of projects involve partnerships with federal agencies, those, those agencies get a nice long look at the students as potential employees. And likewise, the students get a nice long look at these agencies as potential places to work. Um, similarly, the, the, the state natural resource contributes our, our base funding for unit operations, but they receive, you know, they're the primary drivers on our research agendas. And they, like much like the federal agencies, tend to have biologists that work with the students. So there's that, that synergy there where everybody gets a nice long look at each other as potential, um, potential hires. 
And then the, the university receives additional faculty members without any sort of salary costs associated with it. They get greater access to federal funding and in return, they contribute lab and office space. Administrative support for the unit and um, put the, the unit scientists on the graduate faculty. And it's important the only reason that this relationship works is because all these cooperators have input on the research priorities of the unit and they all have um, input on the valuing the performance and productivity of the unit as well. So I answer to a lot of different um, a lot of different bosses in this job. Um, as far as the unit goes, we've been here for 50 years. We were initially formed in, over 50 years now, I should say. Um, Initially formed in 1966 at UH Manila, and the unit was housed there through 2012. Um, in 2012, it was relocated to the UH Hilo campus, and um, unfortunately, it was unstaffed for about four years during some some hard times um, in the federal government with a sequester. But I was hired on in 2016 when the when the unit was restaffed. Um, since the unit's initiation, and this number needs to be updated a little bit, we've had 54 graduate students, um, about 40 master students, and about 13 PhDs have completed their degrees under um, the supervision of unit scientists. And, and um, since about 1996, when I could actually like go do a bunch of Google stalking on, on this, about 40% of our unit alumni have gone on to academic positions. About 30% have gone on to work at government agencies, both state and federal, and about 20% um, went on to work in the private sector, either NGOs or, or just um, private enterprises. And then that's, there's about 10% that kind of dropped off the face of the earth. I couldn't find on uh, through Google stalking. And we're approaching about 100 peer reviewed manuscripts that have come out of the, of the unit and about 40 technical reports. So right now, um, I'm happy to announce that our unit is is currently fully staffed. So the co-op unit here is fully staffed with two scientists. We just recently brought on Dr. Lillian Tuttle Raz this year, um, and she I know will be looking for graduate students, getting getting her program up and and running. Um, I'm always on the lookout for good students as well. Um, our research interests are driven by a combination of cooperator needs and sort of the personal expertise and interest of the unit scientists. So some of the projects we've been involved with include looking at the reproductive ecology and behavior of, of fishes. Um, I, I have a background as, in addition to my marine work in freshwater, so I do a lot of flow ecology and aquatic landscape ecology work. Um, movement and habitat use and distribution of, of, of fishes and other organisms. Um, a lot of work on population dynamics, population structuring, local adaptation issues, fish assemblage structure, and early life history growth and recruitment of fishes. Um, so, you know, these are fairly broad categories and, and we, we tend to be very responsive to whatever um, the needs of our cooperators are. For example, um, right now, we're doing quite a bit of work with uh, Achilles surgeon, Achilles tang, uh, Pakui Kui, um, because that's a species that has been identified as, as a high priority and of, of interest by our state cooperators. Um, just to give a little bit of a flavor of some of the ongoing projects that we have going on, we, we were, have an ongoing study looking at the um, Influence of founder effects on local adaptation reef fishes, where we're looking at morphology and growth patterns in, in um, the three kind of, I don't want to necessarily call them invasive, but they're certainly non native um, reef fishes that have been introduced to, to the islands here Roy, Toao, and Taape. Um, some of our preliminary work that we're, we're working on sending off was we're finding some very wild and wacky uh, morphological differences within. Um, this peacock grouper species, which has been pretty cool. So we're looking to see if there's corresponding differences in growth rate and diets and stuff like that related to these morphological differences. Um, we're doing a lot of work on the influence of life history strategy and behavior and population dynamics. As I mentioned, the Achilles surgeon fish, which is um, the fish pictured here. Um, we're starting to do a little bit of work with wine cleaner wrasse and other species around the island. 
um, doing age growth maturation, just trying to delineate when and where these fish are spawning. Um, and looking at occupancy patterns of these different species as well. So getting into some modeling of habitat um, and habitat use. Um, we also do quite a bit of work related to climate change, um, looking at the uh, potential impacts of climate driven migration on nearshore fisheries. So how do does changing demographics within with among the fishers influence um, how that fishery is used? Um, we have an ongoing study right now looking at how climate change is likely to influence ciguatera prevalence in fishes here in Hawaii um, and looking at how changing hydrological regimes influence um, invasive species distribution and nutrient transport in Hawaiian stream systems. Uh, and then we also have some ongoing work in, in Hawaiian fish ponds as well. Um, a particular interest is how does the restoration of these systems influence nearshore fisheries. Um, and so we've got several projects that we've been looking at trying to um, develop and evaluate bioculturally sensitive sampling to allow local communities to not only monitor these fish populations, but to model and make predictions as well um, going forward of what fish populations are likely to be. And so with that, um, you can reach out to us at the unit at any time. Um, I guess what I forgot to mention is that the unit sort of um, unit students come from a variety of programs within the UH system, and so we have students in the unit that are with the with programs that I'm sure you'll be hearing about here for the rest of the the, the uh, talks. Uh, we have students that come in from the TCBS, the Tropical Conservation Biology and Environmental Sciences program at UH Hilo as master students. We have PhD students from um, the Marine Biology Graduate Program from UH Manoa. Um, and we also get students occasionally in from the Natural Resources Environmental Management Program as, uh, at UH Manoa as well. And so both um, Dr. Dr. Raz and myself hold faculty appointments in numerous departments and are able to bring students on board um, through a number of different departments and programs at UH. And so with that, I'd be happy to answer any questions that you have and turn this thing off and sharing. <clears throat> okay, thanks a lot, Tim. Um, really interesting stuff. And we will have presentations from NREM, uh, TCBS, and the Marine Bio Graduate Program at Manoa, which the admissions committee seems to have gotten Lifetime memberships for Tim and myself. So wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> Seems like it's been a lifetime appointment. Um, we'll I see. Didn't slide up for that. <laughs> Celia is not here yet, but she can clarify. Anyway, are there any questions for Tim and the Fisheries Research Unit? And you have his email address and. Um, I'll be sure to circulate them as well in a follow up email. So you can, if you're thinking of questions, you can email them to him or Lillian later. Lillian actually worked at Pyro here at, at IRC for, for a bit. So a lot of good connections between NOAA and the unit, even though the unit is more Department of Interior. We're, we're one big happy federal family. <laughs> yeah, we have the same boss. Okay. Um, Looks like you're off the hook for questions, Tim, but be tu stay tuned for follow up in any emails and you're, you're welcome to hang out or if you got to go. Uh, feel free to leave at any time. Thanks. Okay, uh, we're running a little bit behind schedule, but we'll make up some time with Mark and Olivia's talks. Next up, we have Dr. Kyle Edwards from UH Manoa oceanography. Um, take it away, Kyle. Thanks. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, Thanks, Don, for uh, inviting me to talk about our grad program. Let's see if I can find the right screen here. Here we go. Looks good. Okay, I look good. Okay, so, um, right, so I'm going to introduce the graduate program in the oceanography department at UH Manoa. 
Um, these are just some images showing uh, students doing research uh, uh, out in the field, you know, either at sea or at coastal locations in the lab doing blue water diving, these sorts of fun things. Um, so in terms of who we are, the department has 27 faculty at this point, and we have 53 grad students enrolled. And we also have a number of undergrads, um, th both through the global environmental science degree program that we run and also other undergrads from other um, departments in the university who are interested in working in our labs. Uh, the department is organized into three divisions. So physical oceanography, marine geology and geochemistry, and biological oceanography. I'm going to focus mostly on the biological oceanography today because that's probably most relevant to um, most of the prospective students here. Um, just to briefly introduce myself, I'm an associate professor of biological oceanography in the department. I'm currently the division head of biological oceanography, which is why I was asked to present today. Um, my email address is here in case you want to follow up, ask me any questions about anything. I think maybe the best way to get a sense for what we do and what kind of things you might do if you uh, joined our grad program is just to go through some of the different research that different students currently in the program are working on. Um, because it's, it is fairly diverse, a lot of different faculty working on a lot of different kinds of topics. So this will just help give you a sense of that breadth. Um, so a number of students are looking at how uh, deep sea mining might affect zooplankton and fish communities. This is a rapidly growing topic of interest because deep sea mining is sort of poised to um, potentially become a big industry in the near future. So a lot of faculty in our uh, in our division are involved in basically trying to get baseline data and from like pilot um, mining projects, see what the potential impacts on ecosystems will be. Another thing a lot of students are working on is um, trying to understand food webs in the ocean, um, often using stable isotopes as a way to trace um, basically what trophic level different organisms are at and, you know, who's eating who, trying to understand how, like, uh, particle flux from the surface ocean to the deep sea, how that moves into the deep sea food webs and all of that sort of stuff. Um, we have a number of students working on viruses and how they affect uh, phytoplankton in particular. So phytoplankton are, of course, um, really important for ocean ecosystems, and they're infected by a really um, diverse range of viruses, and a lot of them are not well understood. We've been discovering a lot of giant viruses, for example, which is very interesting. So trying to understand just what they are, what they do, what their effects are on the phytoplankton is an active area of research. Um, some students are doing product projects in genomics on those viruses and also other microorganisms in the ocean to try to understand um, what their genetic capacities are, how they've evolved over time, and which kinds of um, microbes are living in different areas. A number of students are working on important coastal microbial pathogens. Um, so things like Vibrio um, would be an example. And uh, the aims here are both to have better data on um, you know, when these pathogens show up and under what conditions, and then to develop models, either statistical or dynamic models that can better predict, um, you know, when we should be worried about um, pathogens showing up in the coastal environment. And uh, people are also using the microbial um, community in coastal systems as indicators of water quality. So it can be hard to trace um, like where sewage is getting into the environment and the microbial community, um, because it's very, you know, diverse and sensitive to conditions can be a way to um, potentially trace 
what kinds of uh, where the water is coming from, basically, in different environments. A number of our faculty work on uh, the carbon cycle and operate a long term, very important time series called the Hawaii Ocean Time Series. And one of the things that time series is focused on is understanding how the carbon cycle in the open ocean works. Um, and so understanding the role of um, different microorganisms and other plankton in the carbon cycle and developing new methods to better measure things like primary production and respiration and carbon export to the deep sea is an active area of research. And then there, some students are working on uh, coral reefs. For example, to understand how the microorganisms that are on coral reefs affect the health of corals and how that interacts with things like, um, you know, nutrient pollution and temperature, and also like the macroalgae and how they interact with corals and affect their nutrition. Okay, so that was just to give you a sense of the different kinds of research we do. To get into a little bit of the practical details, we offer both. Uh, masters and PhD degrees. They all involve doing a lot of research. The research is the basis for the degree. Um, we have a 30 day uh, sea uh, field work, or it doesn't have to be at sea, it can be coastal as well. But basically, the point is that you're, you're expected to have a, a field component or at least field experience as part of your research. In terms of our curriculum, we have a fairly extensive curriculum because oceanography is a very interdisciplinary field. And so um, even if your focus is on biology, you're expected to learn about physical oceanography and chemical oceanography and geological oceanography as important context for the biology. And then we also have these three core classes that are required for the biologists, focusing on the microplankton and the pelagic marine animals, the zooplankton and fish. And then there's a class focused on the benthic ecosystems as well. Um, if this is a program you're potentially interested in, one thing you might be a little confused about or just wanting to know more about is what's the difference between marine biology and biological oceanography. A number of our faculty take students through the oceanography grad program, but also the marine biology grad program. Um, so the differences are kind of subtle. It kind of depends on what kind of projects, research you're interested in, what faculty you're interested in, and also what kind of um, like curriculum you're interested in. So I've given our curriculum here as an example of what the kind of focus is in biological oceanography. A lot of it is um, focused on the sort of interaction between physics and chemistry and biology and how all of that works. Um, there tends to be maybe a bit more focused on like the ecosystem scale, but um, compared to maybe a little bit more of an organismal scale in marine biology, but that's, you know, that's just a kind of general trend. It's, there's plenty of students in biological oceanography that are doing fairly organismal projects, I would say. Um, likewise, marine biology tends to be a bit more focused on coastal systems, biological ocean, oceanography a bit more on the open ocean, but again, I gave examples on the previous slide of a number of students doing coastal projects. Um, so really, you know, you should primarily figure out first, I would say, what kind of labs, what kind of advisors you're potentially interested in. And you can talk to them more about which kind of degree program is most appropriate for you. Um, in terms of, a, if you're interested in applying um, we do have some requirements, so um, you know you, you are expected to have a science or engineering undergrad uh, degree, and including uh, you know courses in sort of the basic science topics, um, college level calculus, college level physics and chemistry. We don't require GRE scores any longer, so you don't need to worry about taking. GRE if you're interested in applying. Um, it's often desired that you will have had some prior research experience, um, which of course all of you will have had, and also good grades and letters of recommendation. Hopefully it goes without saying, but in case it doesn't, we you know welcome people from any 
background, ethnicity, gender identity, sexual orientation, et cetera, to apply to the program. Mm -hmm. Um, if you're interested in applying, the next deadline would be in December 15th, but we also have a deadline in September to start in the spring semester. You can go to this link at our website if you want to get more instructions on applying. And I'll just close with a little bit of advice. Um, uh, something that you may or may not know about, a lot of people don't know about this when uh, they're younger, is that um, grad school in the sciences often doesn't cost you anything. Um, that's because there's support for your um, tuition and living expenses, either from research grants that your advisor will have or from teaching assistantships that the department will offer, or you might be able to get um, fellowships that give you a bit more independence. And you know, it's definitely useful to think about different programs you could apply to and what they offer. But the most important thing is going to be identifying um, a mentor, an advisor who, you know, would be interested in having you join their lab and would be doing the kind of research that you're interested in. So the first step would be to contact potential advisors. Doing that around now would be a good time if you're interested in going to grad school in next fall. And also, of course, you know, talk to their current and past students to get a sense for if it's a good fit for you in terms of how the environment in the lab works. You can also think about applying to fellowship opportunities. Uh, one example that students often apply to is the National Science Foundation Graduate Research Fellowship Program. Okay, that's the end of my slides. I can take any questions if you have any. Thanks, Kyle. That was great. A um, lot of important stuff in there, especially your last few slides. I really needed this presentation in 1984 when I, <laughs> when I came to UH Manoa Biological Oceanography. Out of the cold blue, I was trying to figure out what biological oceanography was, but I'm really glad I came. So I definitely have some good feelings about UH Oceanography. Any questions out there for Kyle? Put them in chat or go ahead and unmute. And we will have these presentations available um, with the presenter's consent. I will make them available to all of our interns. Is that okay with you, Kyle? Yep, sounds great. Um, and feel free to email me if you have any questions that come up later. Anyone's watching this on recording. Great. Okay, it uh, looks like you're off the hook for Q and A. Uh, feel free to hang out, or if you got to leave, thanks for dropping in. Uh, we'll see you again next year. Up next, we have Dr. Kirsten Olson from University of Hawaii at Manoa NREM program, and she will explain what the NREM stands for. Um, take it away, Kirsten. Sure. Let me see um, about sharing my screen. Oh, you know what? It's giving me a WebEx issue. Don, how do... Is this, is this one of those where you have to exit and come back in? Oh, okay. Well, in that case, I should have done it earlier. Um, but shall I do that quickly? Sure. Sometimes it's a security setting and you just have to exit and come back. You can try it. I, I did it. I set the security setting when I logged on, but um, it seems... Okay. I'll be right back, guys. Hi, okay. nice to meet you. <laughs> See you in a second. Well, thank you all for joining today. Um, based on the calendar invite, I wasn't sure how many we would get, but I also got a lot of responses that people are interested in the recording that couldn't make it today. So even though our audience is small, we have quality, not quantity, and we have we have some that are going to watch the recording that seems to be working. I see the icon going. Okay, I think Kristen is Came rejoining. Back. Look at okay. that. Give it a shot. Yeah, let's see. Sorry. The WebEx is uh, relatively. It's starting to share. Yeah, let's see if I can get it to do the slideshow though. Okay, what do you guys see? Well, we see presenter view and PowerPoint. Maybe you can swap the screen or something like that. Yeah, hold on. Or, yeah. Let's get here. 
try it again. I'm sorry, guys. It's... No problem. WebEx has its own set of quirks, and I know you are all used to Zoom out there in the academic. I world. am, and now I'm like locked into. Some We're not allowed place. to use Zoom. Right. I don't know what you guys are seeing. I well, we see tell. PowerPoint opening yeah. view. Maybe if you do a. Are you in slide? Are you showing your slides already? We're not seeing that screen. No, I am not showing my slides yet. It's like well, locked. So, well, Webex likes to either share a, a full screen or an application. So if you have multiple screens, you can full screen it on one of your monitors and then share that monitor. Yeah, that is what I was doing. Let me try it again. I just grabbed the wrong screen i let me see share um screen two okay we're getting there okay that looks good hooray thanks guys for your patience hi i am um, kirsten olson i am a, a professor of ecological economics in the department of natural resources and environmental management we are part of the College of Tropical Agriculture and Human Resources, which is the land grant part of this uni university. Um, and if you're not familiar with land grants, um, they are a, a, they were established by the U.S. Congress um, as kind of the original uh, um, universities in each state to serve the needs of the state. Um, and so we're one department of a diversity of departments in the college um, that span um, from molecular biology and bioengineering to uh, fashion design to family and consumer uh, services. Um, and of course, our focus uh, in the department is on the sustainable management of our natural resources and environmental quality. Okay, let's... Um, so a little bit about me, uh, as I said, I'm an ecological economist. Um, I am uh, really interested in ensuring that the value of nature is quantified and incorporated into decision-making. So my research portfolio focuses on ecosystem services, modeling and valuation. So ecosystem services are the benefits that humans get from nature, things like recreation, spiritual well-being, food. Um, so fisheries is, is in there, um, water quality and, and water storage. Um, I do formal accounting of natural capital in order to try to get uh, these, these natural resources into uh, decision-making through um, a, a, a alternate accounting from GDP. So the gross domestic product is an economic indicator that drives a lot of policy, but it is incredibly misleading when it comes to sustainability. Um, so yeah, so I have a diverse uh, research portfolio. Um, a little bit about how I got here. Um, I started out as an environmental engineer, so I have degree, a degree in, uh, two degrees in environmental engineering, and I was an environmental engineer as a career for a while with an international development organization called the World Bank. Um, worked all over the world, um, and I but grew uh, increasingly suspicious of how we did environmental impact assessment and environmental management plans, which were my kuleana at the time there, um, because it all was based on um, economics and, and what kind of the cost benefit analysis. And I felt like there were key things that we were ignoring in formal economic analysis. So I went back um, and I started studying environmental economics, and then I went and got an interdisciplinary degree in environment and resources and studied under some of the preeminent uh, sustainability economists. Um, and then I, uh, I went and did a postdoc. Um, I needed to get out of the classroom and back into the field. Um, and I worked with a, a small marine um, non-governmental organization in Madagascar called Blue Ventures, working um, with small-scale fisheries. Okay, so our department, our department is an interdisciplinary department, arguably um, the only true interdisciplinary department that spans um, social and environmental um, sciences. Um, we are relatively small, um, but we, we have a couple of economists, we have wildlife biologists, we have um, a forest ecologists, we have foresters, we have eco-hydrologists, we have um, uh, uh, anthropologists, um, geographers, um, and uh, 
we have a lot of fun. Um, it's an absolutely fabulous faculty. I am, I am privileged to be part of this group of people um, who do inspiring research and advise an amazing body of students um, in projects that relate to the natural resources and environment of the state, the region, and um, the world. Uh, so there are projects that relate to fire. There are projects that relate to sustainable forestry, to um, biocultural management, community management, um, to pu'eo, the owl conservation, um, fisheries conservation. Um, we have a graduate student body that work under these faculty of about 50 to 60 um, students. I'm, I'm currently not the graduate chair. I gave up that responsibility when I went on sabbatical. I'm on sabbatical right now. So I don't have the numbers off the top of my head of uh, how many PhD and, and master's students, but it's a, it's a robust program um, of about 50 to 60 students. Um, so we have three, uh, well, we have, we have two degrees. We have um, a master's degree, um, which has uh, three different masters that we offer. We offer a plan A, which is thesis driven. Um, you need to have a faculty sponsor. So one of those faculty that I, I just reviewed has to say, yes, we want this student. We would like them in our lab. Um, we have a, a plan C, although this is on hold right now, so you can kind of ignore that. And then we have a master's of environmental management. This is an incredibly popular degree. It's course driven. You do do a capstone, which is an intense and it can be research focused, but it can also be applied management focused. Um, and uh, uh, that's the, the growing program in our department for, for sure. And one thing to note here um, is that every, nearly every at the last year when i when i left as graduate chair it was every graduate student in the master's programs had some form of funding either a research assistantship or a ta ship now i'm not going to lie those those <laughs> fellowships at uh are poverty below poverty wage um so it is it's not easy to pay for your living expenses in hawaii especially right now um but uh we do we do fund all of our students um you have, sometimes you have to hustle but um we get there the masters plan a the thesis driven are often funded by the pis uh in to do the thesis um and the mens are are a little more scrappy and and find funding one of the funding opportunities the prestigious funding opportunities that we have is the haole mauloa foundation graduate assistantship so if you went to high school in hawaii um, I would encourage you to look into that funding opportunity. Okay, um, so just a quick overview of the, the thesis driven masters of science. We have a core, which all master students take um, a year long core um, and everybody takes that together and it's designed to really build camaraderie and a cohort. So you have a graduate cohort. Um, usually the incoming student body is about 20 to 20, 24 students. Um, and then you're required to choose a course in research methods, other graduate courses and specialization courses and do a thesis, obviously. Um, the MEM degrees, the Masters of Environmental Management, you have that core and then you pick a concentration area. So the four concentration areas are geospatial analysis and modeling, environmental policy and economics, applied terrestrial ecology, and land and water resource management. And then there's a long list of courses that we've identified, both NREM courses, as well as courses all over the university that you get to select from to kind of, you know, choose your own adventure. The PhD, it's pretty classic PhD. We do have course requirements. So um, you take that 600 course with all of the incoming graduate students to give you some people around you, right? It's a course, um, that is both uh, content as well as writing driven and a lot of graduates kind of welcome to grad school skills. So, um, you know, you don't have to know, for instance, how to find literature when you enter the grad program and, and we quickly do a tutorial on that or um, and, and we, we really uh, stress good writing um, in that class and all the students who come out of that class say that's the thing they, they appreciated the most was getting really, really structured writing help. Um, but so you have overall, you have uh, like 17 um, courses, of, I mean, 17 credits of re required courses, but you get to select 12 of those, and then you do a dissertation. 
we offer a lot of really interesting, cool courses in the department um, that I, I've thrown up here. These are our upper division gradu uh, undergraduate and graduate classes. Um, but many of our students also um, supplement this with courses in marine bio, oceanography, um, geography, economics, you name it. Um, and so, so long as you fit within the credit requirements, um, which your advisor will help you um, navigate, you could take courses um, all over the university. So application deadlines um, for fall, it's coming up January 1st. Um, spring is September 1st. Uh, there's the website. Um, there's an apply button on the left that gives all of the, the details. The current graduate chair um, is Dr. Susan Crow. Um, you can reach her at nremgrad at hawaii.edu with any questions about applications, admissions, um, program details, et cetera. I'm just standing in for her because done asked. <laughs> um, and it quickly kind of where our students end up, um, they end up everywhere. Um, they end up working for federal agencies, state agencies, uh, NGOs, uh, private sector. Um, and this is just a handful of, of different organizations I could think of yesterday off the top of my head. Um, but it's uh, one of the most delightful things about having been here for a little over a decade now is that I, I now partner in, with state agencies with my former students and with federal agencies. I work with my former students and that is an incredible feeling. I, you know, it's kind of a, 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 a dismal time to be in the environmental field, right? Um, despite some good uh, climate news this weekend, but, um, you know, it, it, those, those connections with the students that we, we nurtured through our program who are now leaders in, in the state and federal government is, is my payback, I think. Um, so, yeah. All right. So that's, let me see if I can, it won't click. There we go. Um, thank you. I just wanted to note that I, uh, I personally am recruiting a couple of students, um, uh, for the coming, hopefully near term on ecosystem based adaptation. So this is the idea that we use nature, um, to adapt to climate change. Uh, so I have some funding for that and there it might be an upcoming study on, um, uh, for the, uh, for DOFA, the forestry and wildlife on, on looking at our trail system, um, and the carrying capacity of our, our trails. So any of you hikers out there who want to make a real impact that might be, an, uh, get people, um, yeah, get people on the trails. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Kirsten. Uh, those sound like amazing opportunities for new grad students. Those, both of those projects sound really cool. And as you mentioned, your students, the student NREM students end up everywhere. I saw one here at IRC this week. <laughs> so they end up at NOAA and all over the place. Very cool. Uh, are there any questions for Kirsten? Throw them in chat or just unmute and ask. And thanks, Kirsten, for taking time out of your sabbatical to join us. Sure thing. Sorry for the technical difficulties with WebEx. <laughs> no worries. Um, we're used to that. That that was actually pretty, pretty streamlined glitch. <laughs> uh, okay, it looks Julia, like. Did you, wait, Julia, did you have a question? Yeah, if you don't mind. Um, so, do you will you have like similar opportunities? Um, at the very end, you mentioned the two things that you're currently looking for for students. Uh, will there be similar opportunities in the future if, like, we still have a little bit of time left at school? Yeah, 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 for sure. I mean, get in touch. I, I mean, I have a pretty diverse research portfolio um, and funding opportunities pop up. Um, you know, part, it, some of the difficulty is always with timing, right? But sometimes there'll be an opportunity. I'll be like, oh, I need to fill this within the next couple of months because the, you know, the funding came through. So. You know, knowing who's interested and what they're interested in and kind of having, you know, an ongoing conversation with people, um, even if it's not in necessarily in my lab, but uh, things come up, you know, across the department for sure. And things come through NOAA, right? Like, you know, Don's colleagues will, will contact me and be like, oh, we have an RA ship. Do you have somebody? So. Okay, awesome. Thank you so much. Are there any other questions for Kirsten? Okay, oh, good luck, guys. Thanks, Kirsten. Nice seeing you. Okay, for a change of pace now, we're going to test my sharing ability.
and we're going to see my academic grandfather, Mark Hickson, talk about UH Manoa Department of Zoology. And I call him my academic grandfather because when he was a professor at Oregon State University, probably back when he was 18 or so, he had a grad student working on his PhD named David Booth. And later in David Booth's career, he was my PhD supervisor. Okay, I'm gonna turn it over to Mark Hickson. Aloha, I'm Mark Hickson. I'm a professor and chair of the zoology graduate program at the University of Hawaii at Manoa. This short video is to introduce you to our program as well as show you how to get through our webpage, which is just packed with information. Now, zoology, of course, is the study of the animal kingdom. And that involves not only studying animals, but also studying all the interactions between animals and their living and non-living environment. So zoology is really just as general as biology in terms of what's covered. Our program has been around since the 1920s and was the original program that covered marine biology and a lot of other disciplines that now have their own graduate programs. Historically, the strengths of our program are in marine biology, as well as evolutionary biology and conservation biology. And all the time, we're starting to expand our expertise in a variety of other areas. One of the advantages of our program relative to others on campus is that we have quite a few teaching assistantships available. This is support for students to hide them over if they're between grants or if they haven't secured a grant yet for the research. It provides a stipend in exchange for teaching in our courses. So the main thing I want to show you today is our web page because there's so much information there that you can virtually find anything you want. So let me share the screen and we'll check it out. So you first want to find your way to the Department of Biology web page. Now, interestingly enough, there is no Department of Biology anymore, nor is there a Department of Zoology. All this has been amalgamated into the new School of Life Sciences, and eventually our web page will change. But to find that web page, you can go to the University of Hawaii at Manoa and simply do a search for biology, or you can type in manoa.hawaii.edu/biology. Once you're here, if you go to the top, there's a graduate menu as well as a people menu that shows our zoology graduate faculty. So let's start with the graduate menu. If you go to admissions, you're going to find everything you need to know about applying to our program. Very importantly, when you're ready to apply to grad school, the first thing to do is to find a graduate advisor. So we have a couple handouts there that are handy for you to download. One is how to apply for graduate school, which is a, a short article from a journal. Another is how to find a good graduate advisor, which is the most important first step. And what we recommend you do is for whatever program, go to find the people. Over here, we have the zoology graduate faculty, and then go down the list and see what they offer. Now, our graduate faculty are divided into three categories, whether they can chair PhD committees, as well as master's committees, or whether they can simply serve on graduate committees. And you can figure that out as you go through. So if we go to regular level three faculty, which are the main faculty, you can see a list of all our faculty. And for any given one, you can slide through and say, look at their web page. We'll choose a random one here. And this is their on-campus web page. They have a variety of websites that are available, um, a little bit about them and their research interests. 
their publications and maybe a little bit about their lab. Here's a list of my grad students, both now and earlier. And you can do that for each and every professor to find the one whose research interests overlap with yours. And then following those guidelines that you can download, contact that person and see if there's opening in their lab or if you can make any connection with them. So the next step is then to apply. So you go back to admissions and go through the steps there. Then we have online resources. There's a variety of things. The most important thing is our handbook for our program, which you can download and look at. It's got a whole bunch of information. It's updated every year. It's exhaust. Always go there first looking for information. Then we have various forms that you use in graduate school. Um, the list of graduate courses that we offer both in biology and zoology. Then research awards to which you can apply if you're in our program. Celebrating our graduate students who have earned various awards through time, which gives you ideas of where to apply for grants. We then have photos of all our recent cohorts of students. Here's the poor pandemic cohort, which is introduced online. We usually have about seven new graduate students in our program or so each year. And finally, an amazing list that's been compiled of all the graduate degrees, master's and PhD degrees in zoologies from the very beginning our first degree was in 1928, all the way to the present, including um, recent students when they graduated their degrees and the title of their dissertations. So I hope that helps you understand our graduate program a bit. If you have any questions, you can always find places to email on our webpage or you can email me directly. My email address is Hickson M. It's my last name, H-I-X-O-N-M, as in Mark, at hawaii.edu. Thank you for your interest in our program and aloha. Thanks, Mark. Um, I guess if you have any questions for the marine bio or for the zoology for the zoology uh, graduate program email mark at h i you got it you got that already um and check out some of his ted talks i hear they're really good next up we have looks like a younger don wearing the same shirt we have Dr. Olivia Nigro talking about HPU, different. Yes, we tested it. Okay, great. Take it away. Okay, guys, home stretch. <laughs> Um, hi, I am Dr. Olivia Nigro. I am the director of the Masters in Marine Science program at Hawaii Pacific University. Um, so first off, if you are looking for information about our program, the probably best, easiest way to find information is on our website. Here is the website address um, listed right here. Um, on our website, you'll find all of our application requirements, a list of faculty descriptions of our dis um, different um, tracks that are within our program. Um, and also there's a list of the different positions that our graduates currently have, or at least the ones that we can locate <laughs> by Google, the ones that are still on the grid. Um, so our program at Hawaii Pacific University is um, relatively new. Um, although Hawaii Pacific University is not new, um, Hawaii Pacific University has been around for quite some time, but the um, MSMS program started in 2007. Um, 
We've had about 200 students graduate or come through our program. We currently have about 35 enrolled. However, our program is growing pretty rapidly. <clears throat> um, in fall 2020, our cohort was about 13 students. And in fall 2021, um, our incoming class is gonna be about 24 students. Um, so Hawaii Pacific University, we are located, so we're back on Oahu. Um, and Hawaii Pacific University has three campuses. Our main campus for the natural science department is located on the windward side of the island um, in Kaneohe, right at the bottom of the poly, right on the cusp of Kailua, um, but it's technically Kaneohe. Um, this is a view of the windward campus. Um, our, the majority of our business offices and many of our undergraduate programs are located downtown. Um, HPU has purchased um, Restaurant Row and a lot of Aloha Tower, so that's where some of our dorms are um, located, et cetera. And if you have to go, um, you know, if you have to do any kind of business aspects, you go downtown to our offices down there. And then the Master in Marine Science program is largely located on our Makapu'u campus. Um, and we are merged with this facility called the Oceanic Institute. Sometimes people refer to that campus as the Oceanic Institute, but the Oceanic Institute is actually an, an entity within Hawaii Pacific University. And so that's all located um, here on kind of the windward tip of the island. So we do not have a PhD program. We only have a master's program. And within that program, we have two tracks. We have a thesis track and an applied track. So a thesis track is a more traditional um, master's degree where you have a research-based um, project under the mentorship of one of our marine faculty. Um, and the applied track program is similar to the thesis track in the coursework, However, there is more of an emphasis on practical skills, analytical skills, um, and some, some more practical knowledge. And the culminating experience of the applied track is an internship, uh, which is from the track where the culminating experience is a thesis. So some more differences between the two tracks. The thesis track requires 36 credits. Um, our core marine science curriculum um, consists of biological oceanography, physical oceanography, um, and chemical oceanography, similar to what you find at um, in the UH oceanography program. Um, you also have to do research credit um, and take elective courses. And then a significant um, time commitment of your of your degree is performing your original research. Um, and then the applied track has a few more credits required because there isn't such a large research component. Um, and so the major differences are first, these applied courses that you have to take. So some examples of those courses are um, graphical information systems or GIS, um, modeling and simulation, biometry, um, multivariate statistical methods. So it's really kind of these more applied technical skills. And then again, you have to complete your internship. So examples of where our students do these internships as part of the applied track on the Oceanic Institute, which again is a partner with HPU. Um, several of our students have worked there. We currently have several students at the Nature Conservancy. Um, so also federal agencies like NOAA and NIST. NIST is also a partner of HPU. Um, and there is a NIST faculty, I mean, sorry, a NIST scientist to the faculty member at HPU, Dr. Um, Jen Lynch, who um, runs our Marine Debris Center, which works on um, plastics and things like that. Um, yeah. And so um, similar to the other internship programs that were described, there isn't a, a finite list of internships you can do. The students are able to contact agencies, and as long as, as the internship is deemed appropriate, um, you can kind of carve your own path and figure out an internship that works the best for you. Um, 
Our student handbook, the Master of Marine Science student handbook, is available online. So everything that I just described, you can read about in more detail. Um, if you go on our website, you can download this. Our application process, um, our application is online. You can find all of this information again on our website. Our GRE is now optional, so you don't have to take it. Um, so we require your undergraduate transcript. Um, you need to have a strong foundation in, in science classes. So we require um, at least, you know, general biology, um, general chemistry, um, physics is also good and um, because you do have to take in some instances physical oceanography. So having um, these core science classes is required um, for admission to HBCU. You have to write an essay, um, talk about your academic interests, submit a resume and letters of recommendation. So we also have a priority deadline of January 15th. Um, we do accept applications after this point. However, for full consideration, we strongly recommend that you get it in by January 15th. And like the other programs had mentioned, we often have to turn away very qualified students because they have not been in touch with an academic advisor um, or they turn their application in later than we recommend and we just don't have space. Okay, so that being said, like the other programs, we really, really strongly suggest that you get in touch with a faculty advisor early. Um, in order to be accepted into the thesis track, you have to have been accepted by a faculty advisor or mentor. So you, we have to have a form filled out that gets submitted that says that this particular faculty member accepts you into their lab. Um, and again, we recommend that you contact these advisors, that you, um, that you investigate them and make sure that your research interests align with their research interests and that they have space. For our applied track, you do not have to have a faculty advisor. In fact, I am the de facto faculty advisor for all of the applied track students. Um, and then you end up working closely with the advisor who is um, your supervisor on your internship. Okay, so some of our faculty members, just to give you guys um, an impression of what we do. So we are not an oceanography department um, like UH or marine biology. We're kind of a combination um, and our program is described as a marine science program. So we have faculty, member, um, faculty members that study a wide variety of things. So these are some of our faculty members. Um, Dr. Ayaki, he studies um, molecular ecology, biodiversity and conservation. Dr. Debbie Tyrenbach. He studies um, largely seabirds. He's really interested in seabirds, um, how they forage, what their diet is made up of, um, and more recently, how they are affected by the current plague of marine plastic. Um, this is me, I'm Dr. Olivia Nigro. I study marine microbiology, um, the Hawaiian microbiome, and I study viruses. Dr. David Field, he studies um, paleo-oceanography. Dr. Tapanunavia, larval biology. Dr. Brendan Holland, he does a lot of biogeography and um, he actually just um, named a new jellyfish species that was discovered here in Hawaii. Um, Keith Kortesmeyer, he studies fish, um, physiology, bioenergetics. And then these faculty members, Dr. Callan and Dr. Lynch, are actually affiliate faculty members um, that aren't the primary marine science faculty members, um, Dr. Callan works for the Oceanic Institute and he does fish aquaculture. He was actually responsible for the aquaculture of the yellow cane. Um, and then this is Dr. Lynch, Dr. Jennifer Lynch, who is one of our research faculty who works for, um, who is actually um, funded by NIST and she studies marine environmental toxicology, chemistry, and marine debris. So she's really interested in plastics and the, um, the accumulation of plastics on the beaches here in Hawaii. And then finally, our two newest professors are Dr. Tom DiCarlo, who studies coral reef physiology, and Dr. Paulina Satina Aradia, 
who studies um, submissile oceanography. So that is currently all of our faculty. We are hiring, we're in the process right now of hiring two more. So we should have a few more faces on the slide in the coming years. Okay, so funding your education at HPU. So similar to the other programs, um, we do offer um, resources for our students to fund their education. Um, we have merit-based tuition waivers to, um, to decrease the amount of tuition that our students pay. And this is um, balanced by being a teaching assistant or a research assistant in a lab. Um, and then additionally, advisors grants are able to supplement that in terms of the T track. Many of our students also have scholarships. We currently have a student who's the Nancy Foster, um, Nancy Foster Fellow. And then of course, there's the traditional routes of student loans and, and um, federal student aid. Okay, that's all I have for you guys. And I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thanks, Olivia, excellent overview. I'm so sorry to, to mangle your life. Okay, thanks, Olivia. And yeah, last year I mispronounced her name. It was terrible. Uh, okay, I'm going to stop sharing here. And if you have any questions for HPU, uh, we'll circulate email contacts for that. And I'm reminded that probably about 20 feet from me right now are um, a former a graduate of the HPU master's program and someone who's going to currently enroll next this upcoming semester, I think. So lots of connections. And Noah, if you have questions about HPU, feel free to reach out to the staff here. Or directly to HPU, and we're going to finish strong with two live talks, and we're going to island hop and move to the Big Island of Hawaii. And Dr. Tracy Vigner is going to talk about UH Hilo's TCBES. Uh, take it away, Tracy. Okay, we can see the screen coming up. It's still in the opening menu of PowerPoint. Cool, there we go. Um, how's your mic working? Tracy, if you're talking, we're not hearing you right now. Can you hear me? Oh, yeah. Now you're coming in loud and clear. Sorry. All these different programs. I don't use this platform. So just trying to get familiar with it. Um, mahalo for attending today. My name is Tracy Wigner. I'm a faculty member at U at the University of Hawaii at Hilo in the Marine Science Department. I'm currently the director of the Tropical Conservation Biology and Environmental Science Graduate Program, which we refer to as TCBS. So TCBS is a Master's of Science granting. Um, we are a broad range program. Um, we are not located in one department. Um, we are across uh, four different colleges um, with lots of participating faculty. Uh, the mission of our program is to foster knowledge of theory and techniques in conservation biology and environmental science. This includes basic and applied science as well as socio-ecological. Uh, we promote scholarly activities in marine and terrestrial environments that enable students to pursue careers in research and natural resource management. And because we're located on Hawaii Island, which is the best island, um, we're able to utilize extraordinary biological, physical, and the cultural co complexity. And these are just some pictures of the diverse students that we have attending our program. So our program began in 2004, and to date we've had over 300 students. So each year we take between 20 to 24 students 
They come in as a cohort starting in the fall. Um, that fall, they take um, at least three of the same classes. They come in and take an introduction to tropical conservation biology and environmental science lecture, as well as lab and then our seminar series. Uh, as I mentioned before, we're not just within one department. Uh, we have more than 45 faculty across four different colleges. This includes the College of Natural, si Natural and Health Sciences. Um, that's where I'm located and also the program. But we have the College of Arts and Sciences, uh, College of Agriculture, and College of Pharmacy. And more and more, we have participation with people from College of Business. So it's a very diverse program. Um, and then we have numerous adjunct and um, affiliate faculty from nonprofit organizations, local, state, and federal agencies. Um, and I encourage you to go to our website to check out the list of all the faculty that participate in the program that are UH Hilo based, as well as our affiliate faculty and all of the different natural resource partners that we work with. And if you want to see more about what the students and the faculty are doing in the program, we have a um, newsletter that comes out every semester highlighting all of those great accomplishments. So we have two tracks in our program. Uh, track one is thesis track. Uh, for this, you need to take 30 credits of coursework. Um, and then thesis of original research. To be accepted into this track, you need to be sponsored by a faculty member. So it's critical if you want to apply to TCBS and be on the thesis track that you reach out to potential faculty advisors early on to see if they are accepting students for the following fall. Um, and this can vary. We, I, I personally don't know who's taking on students. Um, it's up to each individual faculty to decide whether they want to take on students, whether they have funding to support them. So it's really important to figure out what faculty um, do things that you're interested in, make contact with them and see if they're accepting students. Um, because it's ultimately, they sign off on your application for admissions. So we've had very competitive students um, apply to TCBS from very prestigious universities who aren't accepted because there isn't a faculty member um, who has the availability to take them on. So this track is primarily to prepare students in uh, technical positions and often um, they do go on to PhD programs. Uh, the thesis track takes about two to three years, and I'd say on average it's about two and a half years um, for this because students are doing original research and things can happen whether you're doing field work or lab work, things can set you back. So it's it's not, you know, it's it's somewhere between the two and three years. Um, and we've had many graduates go on to do really interesting things across the state. Um, the region, the world, and this is just a taste of a few of them. Uh, Randy Tubal, uh, she has now gone on to work for the Department of Health, Clean Water Branch, Polluted Runoff Control. Uh, John Burns, um, he is now an associate professor at UH Hilo Marine Science Department. Uh, Lucas Mead, he had been the UH Hilo Analytical Lab Manager then went on to work for Hawaii County Department of Planning, and now is director of the Kumo Olo Marine Education Center for Kamehameha Schools. Uh, Troy Sakihara um, works for the Hawaii Department of Aquatic Resources, and Rebecca Most um, works for the Nature Conservancy. So our graduates go on to do lots of different types of activities from the thesis track. Our second track is the professional internship track. Uh, this is relatively new. I believe we are in our third cohort. Um, this has a little bit more coursework associated with it. It's 36 credits. 
Um, the students will do a 600 hour professional internship where they are embedded in an organization. Um, they produce a final paper. It's kind of the equivalent to a thesis, but regarding their internship and also give final presentations. This is a much more streamlined track. Um, and most students finish within two years of starting. We had some setbacks during COVID when we were trying to align the internships, um, but for the most part, the majority of students do fi finish in two years. Um, and just some examples of students um, and the kinds of internships they've done. Um, John Flint worked at Volcanoes National Park. Um, he now works at Coloco Honokohau National Park. Uh, Maya Gordani uh, did her internship at the Three Mountain Alliance and the Nature Conservancy and Coloco Honokohau National Park. So one of the things about the internship track is that our coordinator for that track will work with you personally to figure out what your passion is. Um, and they, she works with the students in that first semester to really nail that down and figure out which agencies would be appropriate to approach and to work with them in developing a professional internship. Um, these students don't have to come in with a internship in mind. They might, and that would be great, um, but you don't have to have something lined up. So what's different for this track is you will apply and depending on your credentials, um, you would be accepted into the track. So you don't need a faculty advisor to sign off on your application for this one. Um, we've had students work at K. Kaiola, the Marine Mammal Center. Um, and then one interesting one was a student who came in and realized that her passion was extraterrestrial biology. Um, and she ended up doing a professional internship at the NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory. And from that, she was offered a PH um, offered admissions into a PhD program at James Cook University in Australia and was offered a position back at the Jet Propulsion Lab when she completes her PhD. So how to apply to our program? Um, you need to earn a baccalaureate degree. This can be from a variety of different disciplines. Um, you need to let us know if you're interested in the thesis or the professional internship track. Um, you will check a box on the application to say which one you're interested in. But remember, if you do want to do the thesis track, you do need to reach out to potential faculty advisors ahead of time to see if they are accepting students. Um, GPA is um, for admission is a 3.0. The way that this is counted is from the last 60 credit hours of your undergraduate work. Um, and then three letters of recommendation and also um, a statement of why you're interested in the TCBS program. Why, why is this program a good fit for you and how it will set you up professionally to pursue the career that you're interested in? Uh, we no longer require the GREs. Um, so, um, all you need to do is set up your letters of recommendation and write your statement and submit your application. So, our priority deadline is December 1st. We encourage people to apply to hit that deadline. That's when we consider students for financial aid and also for other funding intern, other funding opportunities, which can include. Um, graduate assistants at UH Hilo. So these are students that are embedded in a department and assist with the teaching of courses. We have the Haole Maloa Foundation Fellowships. These are for Hawaii high school graduates, um, students who are really interested in staying in Hawaii and um, pursuing careers in conservation. Um, we also have students that are have been awarded different kinds of fellowships from the USGS, US EPA, NOAA, National Science Foundation. Um, and then some of our students are funded through extramural grants from their advisor. So this is the picture, this picture is the last cohort picture we had where we were all in person. So that was fall 2019. You can see here that the weather in Hilo can range from beautiful and sunny, which it is today, 
to torrential downpours. We've got awesome gradients to study all different kinds of environmental science. So if you're interested in your program, please email me. I'd be happy to um, answer any of your questions and how, how, help you during the application process. Uh, mahalo for having me today. Thanks, Tracy. Thanks for joining us on such short notice and giving us a great talk. Um, are there any questions for Tracy and UH Hilo's TCBES? Feel free to unmute or throw them in chat. Uh, we have your email address, so I'm sure there'll be follow up questions coming that way, Tracy. Thanks again. Yeah, thank um, you for having me. No problem. See you next year. <laughs> um, okay, up next, uh, we have Dr. Celia Smith. Who's going to close us out with a talk on the marine bio graduate program at UH Manoa. And this one is near and dear to me because I'm affiliate here. So I uh, yeah. love this thank, program. Thank you, Don. Aloha everyone. Don, I think I'm going to need your help to uh, open up slide deck for me. I can't apparently can't open it online on this end. I'm just, I'm running through the browser. I don't have the desktop app installed. Okay, is it giving you a security setting update kind of message? It says that as browser doesn't support sharing to share content, switch to the desktop app, which would take all the time I have. Okay, Ro you, yep, Roger I that said, you sent it to me yesterday. I will pull that up. Stand great. By. Thank you so much. No problem. And while while we wait for this um, machine issue, um, let me just say, I, I think the programs that you've heard from today, whether they're live or video, would really speak to the number of committed scientists in the state of Hawaii that are interested in marine biology. And there's probably um, <clears throat> great things that you could get from each of these programs that would make it worth your investment. And so it's to your advantage to take a serious look at all of them if there are areas of interest. What uh, hopefully we'll have in a few seconds, and if not, I'll just do some extemporaneous chatting. Um, okay, I, we'll think it's, I think it's coming up. Um, stand by. Let me know if you see anything. Mm, do you see yet, a screen? But there we go. Excellent. That's it. Um, okay, I'm going on mute. It's actually a little scrambled, but we'll go with it. Um, the First piece of information is uh, the the website for our program. A lot of the details that I'll be going over today are much more detailed in at that website so that you can take a, a close look and inform yourself about the opportunities that the University of Hawaii at Manoa allows through this marine biology graduate program. I guess the, the highest level of comment that I want to make for uh, in selling our program at Manoa is that with this, students have the ability, because of the hybrid nature of our program, to actually combine people from ge geology, or now earth science, oceanography, HIMB, and the Col uh, College of Natural Sciences biologists, all on one student's committee. We have uh, been freed of the shackles that we've had in the past, where we had to have uh, departments that, um, offer real boundaries to the people that you could have on your committees, whether it was for a master's or a PhD. This program combines the resources and faculty of SOST as well as the College of Natural Sciences together in a really exciting way that allows for students to pursue with the best expertise UH can, or Manoa can offer the questions that you have and get the best advice along the way. So with that brief overview, then that explains why we have two co-directors. I'm one of two co-directors. Um, this is where the slide got a little scrambled. Megan Donahue is our representative from the SOST side. Um, she's actually positioned at HMB. I'm Celia Smith in the School of Life Science. Together, Megan and I actually administer the program and Carrie Ann Caruso, this name that's on the bottom, is our new program coordinator who's got about a month in office at this point. She will become your best friend if you become a student in this program because she will have all the information that you need to keep on track as well as uh, move forward in your program. Next slide, please. There we go. Our mission is, is rather boldly stated here, but we, we're going for it with this program. We wanna nurture world-class communities of students 
and faculty who are dedicated to bringing innovative scientific research and education and engagement for the benefit of the participants, you, the students, as well as the state, the nation, and the world. So yeah, that's a really big set of, of goals for our mission. But if you don't have high points to strive for, you you know, you may not make the even part of the way. So these goals, I think, are this mission statement helps you see what we have in mind in our trajectory. I would add to this that um, we are developing as of uh, the last uh, 18 months, another initiative that should be in here, and that is to develop world-class community of students and faculty who know how to work in indigenous cultures. We are currently running a class, an intensive two-week class for the cohort that's, com that came, that's coming in this fall. Um, they are out uh, pulling weeds in the Teralo'i, um, just up above uh, HIMB. They're going to be in the fish pond tomorrow. They're up at Papahana Kuola working and pulling weeds from the streams today. They are working with community and partners at the beginning so that their research will not just be a kind of helicopter science where you drop in and do your science and then leave. In fact, the community, we hope, may actually inform the science that you do through these activities. This is a really exciting new initiative for us. It's not required that everybody's work has an indigenous component, but as we shape the future, this is part of what we can do with our program. So our goals for the students are to be the leaders in marine biology and in, in uh, working with indigenous cultures and conservation resource management w that transcends these disciplinary boundaries and applies leading edge research techniques that challenge fundamental and applied problems. Um, this, these goals, I think, are what anybody interested in marine biology would be drawn to. And this helps us, helps you understand why our graduate um, application pool is about, uh, it averages about 100 students each cycle in the fall. We um, accept about 100, last year it was 135 applications. We accept about 20 students, so roughly about 16 to 17% as we uh, offer these exciting opportunities. Next slide, please. Our students address critical needs as you would expect because we set those as our mission statement. And these titles are from fairly recent papers, it's not the most up to date. That would be, a, um, a, this would be a way for you to see the nature of the um, range of topics that are under discussion or under research. Stressors for coral reproduction, evaluating bioeconomic trade-offs or fishing reserves, looking at submarine groundwater discharge onto reefs, assessing coral bleaching using unmanned aerial systems, topics that are clearly associated with state needs like the 30 by 30 initiative for managing effectively managing marine resources it also in these next few years will tie in with the designation of the heia national estuarine research reserve which is a NOAA um, uh, component that brings on another round of research opportunities staff and um, funding for students to work. They have approximately, I think the number this year is 12 uh, NERS fellows that are funded through the funding that comes to the NERS. Next slide, please. So in brief, our program, although we attained uh, permanent status only as recent as 2020, the program started in 2012 as a provisional program 2020, we finally made the jump into being recognized as a permanent program. We've started our new intensive curriculum. Uh, this um, MBIO 600 is the part of that new intensive curriculum. Let me just talk a second about those. Those new courses are three weeks long. You are working two days intensively at HIMB with a faculty member. The number of students is limited to approximately 10 in a class. They, this is uh, what it's like to be a student at a marine station. If you've ever had the chance to visit some of these places where researchers are working around the clock, this intensive format gives you the opportunity to immerse yourself fully in the uh, activities that are outlined for the particular classes. At this point, we have, I believe, eight 
intensive classes that are available for students to take. They uh, essentially are one full 15 credit level work, worth of work associated with that intensive class. We also have regular courses as well, the regular 15 week classes so that students are actually trying to balance by taking some of these intensive things as well as taking the more traditional classes. In order to teach these classes, we tap our 44 regular and cooperating faculty, some of whom are actually on, on this call also, like Tim Grabowski. We've got affiliate faculty as well. Don is one of our, our most favorite for his service to our program, but there are many others who are also dedicated to this program and from U.S. Fish and Wildlife, from the state natural um, DLNR natural resources, as well as NGOs like uh, Conservation International. So that gives you a sense of our faculty. We have pay, um, descriptions for each of these people on our website. So if you're curious, please go take a look. Um, here are some of the details for our um, recent cycle of application, um, about uh, 92 a year. I uh, recently cited 135. That was for this year. This is the average selectivity of about 17%. Current enrollment about twice as many PhD students as master's students. We have awarded a number of degrees, many more masters, of course, because they take less time than the PhDs. A striking thing about our program is that about a quarter of our students are already supported by competitive training, training grants, grants that they have brought in or have been awarded by various federal agencies or others to support them in their period of teaching or a period of, of training, uh, virtually every one of our students is supported by either a teaching assistantship or by support that's brought in from their own. We have at this point, I believe, as many as five National Science uh, Foundation graduate research fellows in this cohort. Nat we have just recently uh, learned that we gained a Nancy Foster Scholar as one of the um, new people to add that brings two in our current program. We have Margaret Davidson fellows as well as Ford Foundation fellows. So this is a group that is, um, has a lot of credentials that make them stand out. A number of the earlier people in the uh, discussion have said that it's, it's not enough though to be this kind of high quality student. Uh, you must also, um, in order to be successful in the marine biology graduate program in the acceptance cycle, we've really shifted, as many others have as well, to, to build, building a program where there's a relationship already established between you, the student, with all these Sterling credentials, and a faculty member where that relationship becomes mature enough that the faculty member will commit to supporting you as a mentor or providing lab space, providing funding if you need it in, in, the period of, uh, per, in the period for your training. So the level of support that comes in with the students is one thing that gives us confidence that we're doing a good job, but actually this intimate relationship with your mentor uh, being identified before you enter the program, I think is key to the long-term success so that you are not surprised, you understand and will quickly assimilate into the culture of that laboratory and be successful in the long term. That is a, um, a new shift for us in the last couple of years. We've been working on it all along, but now we have it actually formalized. So if you're interested in uh, uh, participating in the Marine Biology Graduate Program, please start now talking to the faculty who might be of interest for you for mentoring. As was said earlier, they may not be taking students this year. That would be really good to know so you don't put time into developing paperwork and essays and parts of your application. Start that discussion now. Okay, next slide, please. Um, our academic journey has several features. These are pretty standard, 30 credits uh, for master's students. Uh, if you come in as a PhD without master's, you have to also get the credit. The core intensive courses are also relevant in these. All of the courses that you can take that are under the marine bio header will work. 
We want the program at the end, the student to have a working in-depth knowledge of marine biological systems and the processes that link them to the nearshore and offshore environments. We're looking for the opportunity to demonstrate expertise in quantitative and qualitative methods for field and laboratory research and advanced competency in writing, communicating your science as professional um, in, uh, as a professional in meetings or in grant writing. So these are the things that we will work on with you as you go into these two different programs, either the master's or the PhD. Let me say, however, in contrast to the HELO program, we only accept students in a research master's. We have no alternative one. You don't have another track that you can take. This is a what's called a Manoa Plan A. Um, there are no alternate plans for you to take. So uh, this is really focused on developing researchers. Next slide, please. This is information from the website. So you can see the kind of pace that we expect students to be able to maintain for the academic flow. This would be Plan A Masters. Next, please. This is the beginning of the PhD. You can see it actually doesn't have a lot of, of difference. It's extended in time, and that's to allow you to actually have things like a comprehensive exam, meeting with your committee to discuss your propo dissertation proposal, uh, passing your comprehensive exam, and then in the next slide, spending the next uh, spending the last two years actually getting a lot of really high quality research done after your coursework and your forms uh, for the comprehensive exam are finished so these are um, the straightforward flows we generally think of a master's as two to three years a phd is four to five years um, covid frankly has hit a lot of our students hard you're going to see deadlines uh, people graduating that have past those deadlines, but that's the way it goes. Next slide, please. I think is just in closing us out. Uh, we want to have that um, with students who are dedicating their careers to marine biology and join, so join us in our PhD or our master's degree programs so that we can help work together in uh, the challenges that we face as we go into the latter part of this century. I'm uh, happy to take any questions, even though I know I'm over time. Thanks, Don. Any Thanks, questions? Celia. Uh, are there any questions for Celia? Um, so I'm in chat or unmute and and blurt them out. Um, we had some people that had to leave, but we did record this session. So with your permission, Celia, we'll share the presentation and the recording and. You'll probably get some follow up via email. That'd be fine. Um, yes, I, I welcome that. I see a number of friendly faces already in the audience, like you, Carolyn. Nice to see you. Okay, any uh, last call for any questions for Celia and the Marine Bio Graduate Program? Okay, come join us. Thanks again, Celia. Um, We'll see you next year. Well, actually, I'll see you probably Friday at Satara's Defense. Yeah. <laughs> oh, no. Yeah, maybe. Thank you so much, everybody. Aloha. Okay, I think we're going to close out. Uh, this session was recorded. So uh, if you missed something or you came in late, we will have the whole thing on a video for you, on a video recording for you. Thanks for joining us. Um, I see some of our PIF staff here, Kise and Ryan. Uh, did they want to say anything? Maybe not. No. Nope. Yeah. <laughs> just just listening and seeing your okay. programs. Well, thanks for joining us, Ryan. Anything from you, Kise? Oh, you're muted. Still muted. This may not work. I don't see a microphone icon next to your name in the participants list. Maybe that headset is glitchy. Okay, it's... try again.
It's kind of sort of working, but we're not hearing anything. <laughs> well, thank you, Don. I appreciate okay, thanks, it. Celia. Mahalo, everyone. Yeah. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. So, Casey, if you have any words of wisdom, throw them in chat and we'll capture it that way. <laughs> um, Julia, Caroline, Juliana, any questions for us before we close out? Was there any graduate program that you were interested in that we missed covering from Hawaii? No? Okay. Cool. All right. Um, I'm going to end the session. Sorry, Kisei. We won't get your chance next year. <laughs> WebEx is no has is notorious for these kinds of glitches. Um, I'm surprised though, because it worked fine for our event last week. See ya.